Good morning, Central Christian Church. Welcome to uh, Sunday morning service. Um, very happy to see everybody, to be able to worship with you and to sing. Would you stand? And we are going to open in a word of prayer. Uh, Lord, we love you, and we thank you so much for uh, the gift of the cross. Lord, for the gift of your son. Lord, for grace and peace and love that is known through him. Lord, uh, we pray that you are glorified in our fellowship this morning and uh, that uh, our songs and uh, our opening of the word in our fellowship uh, is, uh, is, is a sweet aroma to you. Lord, we love you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. In the blood of Christ, there is power in that blood. I'm going to hit just a couple of announcements before we, before we uh, go on. Uh, next Sunday, it's very important to note, we are going to have a one service at 10 a.m. So if you come at 830, you will be all by yourself. You'll have to wait till 10. But the advantage is following that, we are going to have a Memorial Day kind of celebration, do a, a lunch out, hopefully in the parking lot if it's nice, but perhaps in the gym if the weather doesn't cooperate. So next week, one service, 10 o'clock, mark your calendars. And uh, also, um, there was supposed to be a, a meeting coming up uh, for VBS. That meeting is going to be postponed, but there is still information. You can still sign the kids up. And uh, there's also a prayer calendar. If you would like to pray for the kids and uh, the, uh, 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 the, well, the helpers, everyone, in, everything involved in VBS, um, there is a calendar out there and gives you something to pray for. 
every day. Um, let's continue in worship. Christ, on Christ, the solid rock, we stand. his house on the sand. I don't know if he just wanted some beachfront property, but everyone knows you don't build your house on the sand. We are going to build our house on the rock, and uh, we will be forever with him. What a day that will be. i 
called to pray. We are called to go to the Lord with our needs, with the desires of our heart, and with the situations that bombard us continually. This morning and our entire lives should be a sweet hour of prayer. a seat. I, uh, I have a friend who is also in, in ministry and uh, told me a story about arriving at a, at a church um, and beginning to get settled in at, at that church. And the church that he was going to had some conflict. Um, and of course, he knew that when he, when he went, but he was still excited to get started. And, and not long after he was, he was there, um, he was invited to dinner by some members of the church um, invited him over for, for dinner, and uh, of course, he accepted that invitation, um, and, and he was excited to, to get to know the people of, of the church, and, and that evening, 
Um, he, he headed over excited for the evening. And when he got there, um, they, before they'd even sat down for dinner, uh, he was hit with everything that was wrong with the church, everything that he was already doing wrong, everything he ought to do, according to his host. Um, and uh, so he still gets, still gets gun shy anytime he, anybody offers him fried chicken. It's just, you know, um, a, ten, a tense dinner. Um, have you ever gone to dinner or anywhere or any situation where it's just tense? Maybe even, maybe even hostile, where you just knew things weren't going to go well. Uh, and uh, we're, we're, we're in week five um, of our series, Dinner with Jesus, um, and, and that is the case in, in this morning's uh, text, a tense, a tense dinner. We're taking a look at the meals that, that Jesus ate, the people that he, that he ate them with, what happened at those meals, and what he taught us at those meals. Um, meals are actually probably one of the best times, one of the best situations to kind of get to know people better. Um, to, to really see, to see them, um, and, and many of the meals and the scenarios where we see Jesus sharing a meal with, with someone are places where I think we get to know him and his heart and the people he shared those meals with better. Oftentimes we see a little bit of ourselves in those people, or, or maybe we should, for better or, or for worse. Um, and, and sometimes that can be encouraging, and sometimes that can be convicting, so far, we've seen Jesus uh, at a party thrown by one of his disciples, Levi, uh, inviting all of his, his tax collector friends, showing, uh, showing us Jesus not avoiding, but embracing uh, the, the tax collectors and, and the sinners, uh, something that he was accused of by the religious elite. Um, and it was not only true, but it was really his mission. We, we saw him share a picnic with thousands, beginning with one small lunch. Astonished disciples in, in that. And, and, and Jesus saw and cared about the people uh, when, when his disciples really just saw a problem that, that, that need, they couldn't solve. And we saw Jesus hinting at in that case what, what uh, he would soon just come out and say, that he is the bread of life. We saw Jesus eat in the home of Mar Martha and Mary, addressing a small conflict between them, a tension between them, but, but lovingly directing them towards himself, showing that there is also a, a time to serve and that there's a, a time to simply trust and, and listen to his word. Last week, we, we looked at as Jesus ate in the, in the house of a Pharisee, how, how dinner was interrupted by a woman, a, a prostitute, who recognized in that case uh, the grace and the mercy of God when the Pharisee didn't. And this week, we see something similar, at least in part. Jesus invited again to the house of a Pharisee. And I guess you could say, again, he's not real well received. Uh, some things never change. Some, some things just don't go so well. So let's look at the beginning of that. And I would encourage you just to go ahead and open your Bible to Luke chapter 11. We're going to kind of work through that piece by piece. Uh, but we're going to start here with verses 37 through 39. It says, while Jesus was speaking... A Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went and he reclined at the table. The Pharisee was astonished to see that he did not first wash before dinner. The Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. That's not all he said, but we're going to stop there for a minute. If you were, report if you were reporting on this encounter, or if this were an encounter that happened between well-known people or diplomats or something, you would say, you know, the news would say that they had frank and direct discussion. Uh, this is actually kind of, an, in some ways, a little bit of an unusual text, though, because it runs a little counter to the image that we often have in our head of Jesus. I, I think that because we know of his love and his grace and his mercy, we often think of everything as just kind of calm and, and soft-spoken, an image that gets confirmed by art, movies, you know, any, any depiction. Actually, even many of the gospel accounts, if we just focus on those, if we avoid texts like the one this morning. But, but here we see uh, anger. We, we see Jesus harsh. Uh, it, it's a righteous anger, not a self-righteous anger like we are often tempted, but, but righteous um, Actually, in, in the book, Jesus, Mean and Wild, Mark Golley wrote this about, about Jesus' 
harsh encounters like this. It says, Jesus was a sharp judge of character, and he employed anger even when he was aware it wasn't going to do any good. Why? Because sometimes the most honest and truthful response to foolishness or evil is anger. Jesus couldn't have integrity if he was indifferent. Over and over again, the gospel accounts show us Jesus' harshest words tend to be reserved for the Pharisees, a group called the Pharisees, the religious elite at the time. Um, These are people who were devout. They were religious, which has has come to be a a negative word, partly because of these depictions, uh, you know, but but really was not a was not a negative word in that day, and by definition isn't isn't even now, um, even though it has some negative connotations. His confrontations with the Pharisees, though, really actually have to do with their pride, uh, with their desire for for power, and especially with their hypocrisy. I mentioned before, um, you you can actually find a, a lot out about any scripture mostly. Uh, what it's trying to communicate by looking at what happens around it, what's, what happens right before it, and what happens right after it. And that is the case uh, with this text uh, as well. Um, in, in, the, in the following chapter, skip ahead, we're going to come back, but in the following chapter, Luke actually records for us Jesus teaching his disciples and using the Pharisees as an example. It's in chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. He says, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy teaching his disciples is nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the housetops. See, all of the the condemnation that Jesus elaborates in the text we're going to read to the Pharisees can be really summed up in that, this this leaven of the Pharisees, this hypocrisy, which is a word that gets thrown around a lot sometimes correctly, because there's plenty of it, uh, and sometimes incorrectly. Hypocrisy isn't just setting standards or morals that you don't keep. The reality is we should all want to do better than we do, and we we should want to be better than we are, and, and we should strive for that. But hypocrisy is actually hiding the fact that we don't meet those standards while expecting them of other people. Uh, This this is what angered Jesus about the Pharisees and and what he addresses at dinner here. Jesus isn't, uh, excuse me, is invited to the house of the Pharisees for dinner, but it isn't just dinner, even in historical terms. Uh, It's also dinners like this were for discussion. If you invite someone to dinner, you expect to have conversation with them. It would be the same here, but but even more so. It was a, a regular social interaction. The point of the dinner was to learn, to teach, to debate, to discuss the religious topics of the day. But in this case, it goes south before food even hits the table. I mean, as soon as Jesus sits down, it it goes it goes south. Um, This is this is not just where dinner is going to be served, but it's also where this discussion happens. Um, and, And and what happens is is Jesus walks into the house and he heads straight to the table without stopping to wash his hands. Now, moms, I know what you're thinking right now. You're like, he should wash his hands. Everybody should wash their hands. It's good hygiene, don't we? Teach our, we teach our children to wash their hands. Except that that's not exactly, it, it didn't carry the same understanding. That's not exactly what is meant here by washing your hands. Uh, think historically for a second, there's no running water. In fact, there's not really any understanding generally about germs. In fact, you would be in this case washing your hands in the same dirty water that everybody else washed their hands in. So there's nothing cleanliness wise to be gained by that. What it was about was being ceremonial clean, ceremonially clean. And even though it was about being ceremonially clean, it wasn't part of the law. It was tradition. It was, it, and it was part of the many, many rules that these Pharisees had come up with to improve upon God's law. So this isn't, you know, he, he forgot to wash his hands when, you know, before, before dinner. It, it's, it's a very different situation. Jesus isn't following their rules. That's what's, that's what's upsetting. That's why his host is astonished. 
And I don't think this is one of those incidents where Jesus, you know, it, it, the scriptures kind of indicate that Jesus understands the thoughts of someone with, where nobody else probably did. Um, I think, I think this, the fact that it says he was astonished is probably evidence that everybody saw it and everybody noticed. Whether he had something to say about the fact that Jesus hadn't washed or whether it was just a, <gasps> you know, just a big gasp, uh, whatever it was, it told the story to, to everybody. This is, and this is where Jesus just kind of gets started. Um, the rest of this text is just Jesus laying into them. It, it, it's where he defines that leaven of the Pharisees that he's going to, to later refer to with his, his disciples. Now, um, as far as sermon points go and, and outlines go, um, I, I'm just going to put a little disclaimer on this one because this is a little weird. This one's going to be a, a little strange. Um, we're, we're, we're going to look at a whole laundry list of faults that Jesus uh, gives of, of them. And, uh, and with each one of them, uh, we're going to look at how to be a Pharisee. Like that, how to be a Pharisee. Not, not a typical, uh, like, I, I don't want to be a Pharisee. Um, just what you wanted, right? Who, who doesn't want to be like a Pharisee? Uh, uh, what, pretty much anybody who's, who's uh, set foot in church and not set foot in church knows uh, the, the term and what a Pharisee is, um, and, and we know it's not a good thing the way we use it. Um, here's the deal, though. If you want to know, if you, want to, uh, if you know exactly what one is, then you know how not to be one. So this is kind of a, a do-the-opposite thing. Um, any of you ever used to watch Seinfeld? It, it was a, a sitcom mostly in the 90s, um, and even if you've never watched it, you've probably heard of it maybe even know who the main characters are in it. There's an episode where one of the characters, George, um, has an epiphany. He, he realizes that every decision in his, every decision I've ever made has been wrong. That's, that, that's it's like, I've, I've done every time, every instinct he has, every aspect of his life, every decision down to the, the food that he chooses to eat is wrong. So he says, I will do the opposite. Like whatever, whatever my brain says, I'm just going to do, do the opposite. And he starts immediately by ordering something different off the menu and goes about the rest of the episode saying and doing the exact opposite of what his instinct tells him. So when we look at, at how to be a Pharisee, obviously I'm being a little facetious, but let's do the opposite. <laughs> um, so, so here goes. How to be a Pharisee. Number one, care about the outside more than the inside. Care about the outside more than the inside. Verse 39 through 41, it says, And the Lord said to him, Now you Pharisees, cleanse the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, do not, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? Give alms to those, to those things that are within, and behold, everything is clean for you. He's basically saying washing. You want to talk about washing? You, you try to keep the wrong things clean. All you care about is the outside, and the inside is dirty. The Pharisees keep up appearances, but on the inside, it's like that Tupperware in the back of your fridge. You know the one I'm talking about, the one that you don't dare open, uh, the, the one that your sixth grader considered using as a science experiment, the one that's like, you know what, we're just not going to wash that dish, we're just going to leave the lid on it, put it in the trash, be done with it, because it is dirty and nasty on the inside yet the outside's clean. And yet, isn't that the temptation for every one of us? To, to concern ourselves with appearances, neglecting our, our heart even in, the, in some cases, but making sure that on the outside, everything is okay. Everything looks good. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, For the Lord sees not, a, uh, sees not what a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that was an instance about David, and they were looking toward, uh, you know, somebody looking good on the outside and expectations for leadership, but it applies the same. God cares about what's on the inside, the heart. Let us seek him. Let us seek his, his kingdom and let him give our heart new desires and let the outside be what the outside is. Verse 42, carrying on. But woe to you Pharisees. But woe to you, just stop right there. Uh, woe is, isn't a word we use a whole lot. Uh, and, and if you do, you probably think like, woe is me. 
Um, that, that's not what he's saying. It's not, this isn't pity. Um, th- this is Jesus saying, woe, because you are under God's judgment. That's, I mean, it, it's a judgmental term that he's using. But, but again, woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and love of God. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So second thing, rule number two, if you want to be a Pharisee, how to be a Pharisee. Major in the minors and my, minor in the majors. Major in the minors and minor in the majors. They make such a huge deal out of some things and then ignore these more important things. Pharisees just kept the letter of the law. They even made extra law as well as, as anyone could. They, in fact, here's the thing, that reference to tithing, they, they tithed of their herbs. Now, it's normal. Money's a little different then. It's normal to tithe of, what, of, you, of your produce. If you're a farmer, then you tithe of your produce. But they were so meticulous that they were weighing leaves to make sure that I turn in my 10%. They, turn, they turned God's law into a petty bureaucratic code. That, that's what they were doing. And at the same time, they were ignoring those who were hurting and those who were hungry. That's what he's condemning here. Major in the minors, minor in the majors. And again, aren't we tempted sometimes to care about things that really aren't that big of a deal and, and make a big deal out of them, and yet things that really are critical, maybe we don't pay enough attention to. Micah 6, eight says, He has told you, a man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? What does he really want? But to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. Let us be people who do justice who, who in, in helping others, who love kindness or kind to others, and, and who walk humbly. Verse 43, he, he's got another one. Woe to you Pharisees, again, for, for you love the best seat in the synagogue and greetings in the marketplace. How to be a Pharisee, number three, crave recognition. And that, that's what he's talking about here. Nobody likes to be ignored. Nobody likes to be overlooked. But that is not the same as, as needing to be admired and seen, being, in today's terms, an influencer. Uh, we live in a culture that values fame and recognition above almost anything. Even being known for something bad seems better than not being known, I think, in our culture. And honestly, some of it is it bleeds over into the church. It's a piece of the Christian subculture as well. Uh, even some well-known and famous preachers become famous because of their gifts and their charisma and because they seek it out without having the character to match it. Beware of people who crave that kind of recognition. Probably more important, beware of that craving within ourselves. Verse 44, another one. Woe to you. You are like unmarked graves. People walk over them without knowing it. Jesus is accusing them of leading people astray. And it's going to require a little bit of, of, of rec, uh, an explanation. But to be like a Pharisee, lead others astray. Uh, this, again, this, this requires a little bit more explanation. To, to touch a corpse, you probably know this one just from other references to Scripture. To touch a corpse would make a person unclean, like ceremonially, so they would not be able to participate in, in worship. Uh, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't want to touch a dead body because you couldn't go to synagogue, you couldn't go to temple, you couldn't do these things. Um, the, these were, you know, now what the Pharisees did is made more hyper-technical rules, so you're not even allowed to touch a grave. And Jesus is calling them unmarked graves. People are touching them without knowing it, and they're dirtying themselves. You, you, you think that you're so clean, but you're dirtying other people with your rules. People, people who don't even know it, you're leading them, you're leading them astray. Not, all, not only are they wrong, not only are they prideful and arrogant and hypocritical, but they're dragging other people down with them. Hard, these are, are extremely harsh words for, for some people who, uh, for, for a group of people who think so highly of themselves and who are used to being thought so highly of. And we often fail to consider the effects of our own sins on others, even the sin of legalism in this case. Now, this dinner wasn't just, just Pharisees, but lawyers also, because it, it hits on the next thing. Um, if you have any lawyers in here, I apologize. You're probably used to being picked on a little bit, 
but you know, lawyer jokes and all, but honestly, this isn't really the same thing. Um, these are religious lawyers, um, which is basically what that means is, is they interpreted the law. They're a higher class of Pharisee. They're the professional Pharisees is, is what they are. They defined what the Torah really meant for, for everybody. Um, and apparently one of them thinks, you know, surely you don't mean us. Um, and so he says as much here in verse 45, 46. One of the lawyers answered him, teacher, in saying these things, you insult us also. Kind of the point, but um, he ends up getting a little more than he bargained for. Jesus just pipes right back in and he says, woe to you lawyers also. For you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. How to be a Pharisee, number five. Make rules you don't practice. Uh, As a child, did you ever hear the phrase, do as I say, not as I do? How did you receive that? How do you receive that today? Have you ever been tempted to say it? Uh, know, knowing that you are not following your own standards. Uh, this is, quite frankly, what he addresses here is the classic definition of hypocrisy. Setting standards, making rules, and then also eh, setting up loopholes that keep me from having to really worry about them. Setting impossible standards for others and not really keeping them yourself. The, the Pharisees have made God a burden. But Jesus says in Matthew chapter 11, he says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. If you, could con- if you could compare our need to salvation, need for salvation to a person drowning, then these guys, the Pharisees and the lawyers, they're handing out barbells and telling people that they're life preservers. That's basically what, what they're doing. They're pretending to help, but they're just making things more difficult. Now, addressing this isn't really about moral compromise. It's about the nitpicky rules that, that they're, they're having here. When someone comes to Jesus, do we lighten their load? That seems to be what Jesus is saying. And he continues there in verse 47. Woe to you, for you build tombs to the prophets who your fathers killed. Your witnesses... And you, and you consent to the deeds of your fathers, for they killed them, and you build their tombs. Therefore also the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that the blood of all the prophets shed from the foundation of the world may be charged against this generation. From the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who perished between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be required of this generation." That's probably a lot kind of confusing, really specific to their situation, but actually, believe it or not, it applies. And these lawyers, these professional Pharisees, had actually constructed these huge elaborate tombs to the prophets of the Old Testament, monuments to the prophets who their ancestors killed, but really monuments to themselves, monuments to their greatness for doing it and their generosity and their greatness and all of these things. Monuments that they really personally couldn't care less about to prophets that they really couldn't care less about. And and that is where this one hits home with us because the Pharisees paid lip service to things they didn't care about. Paid lip service to the things you don't care about, which is really about image. And you're probably sensing some overlap here. It's about looking good, about keeping the outside clean, wanting to be admired. Verse 52, he hits him with another one. I mean, it's just just hit time after time. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves, and you hindered those who were entering. Might be the worst one. To be like a Pharisee, make God inaccessible. That's what they're doing. They're making relationship with him impossible. God's law and God's grace are both visible throughout the Old Testament and New. And they have hidden that in the old. They, they have ignored God's forgiveness, and they have ignored the one who God offers that forgiveness through, who happens to be sitting there at the table with them. They've taught people that the only way to God is to follow the law, the rules, including, of course, all the minutiae, all the little rules that they've invented to go along with it. They've made salvation difficult. They've made people feel like they cannot approach God, that they cannot come to God. They've made him inaccessible. 
And yet Jesus welcomes sinners. So clearly he's not as exclusive as they're being. And he welcomes children. So I have to assume it can't be that complicated. Last few verses in our text here kind of stand out to me in the story. Um, A little unusual. He's done condemning them. But then it tells us, as, as he went away from there, the scribes and the Pharisees began to press him hard and to provoke him to speak about many things lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. They, they pressed him and provoked him. I can't help but think that's just a little bit amusing, and this is the reason. That's already happened. After everything he's already said to them, what are they trying to get him to, to say more? It seems like he's been pr- pr- plenty provoked here at, at dinner, and yet they're lying in wait to catch him in, in something he might say. Seems like he might have already said it all, but they have no defense. They have no way to refute that, (laughs) what he said, because he just accurately described them. It was not, I mean, it was, it was righteous condemnation. Now, the temptation for us is to look at all of this, because it's kind of about them. It's about the Pharisees and and think, you know, get them, Jesus. Uh, They they deserve it, these jerks, you know, Pharisees. Uh, the reality is, is though the, the behaviors that Jesus condemns in the Pharisee are behaviors that everyone is tempted with, religious or not. Who doesn't want to look good? Who doesn't sometimes neglect what is important for what isn't? Who isn't tempted to judge others more harshly than ourselves? Now, what, what made the Pharisees different is that they convicted everyone themselves included, that, that or convinced everyone, them, themselves included, that their sin wasn't sin. Like, I, I, we've, we're okay. Um, and I think we should be careful. The, the reality is, anyone could, in that recip- sense, be a Pharisee. It's, it's not just a matter of, of pride and, un- or, excuse me, it is just a matter of pride and unwillingness to, to repent. Jesus warned his disciples Actually, he warned them right before this passage in chapter 11. Therefore, be careful lest the light in you be darkness. What you think is good may not, may not be. Be careful that you don't think that you're without sin. Be careful that you don't think that, that what is dark is actually light. As followers of, of Jesus, let's concern ourselves with the inside of the cup. Let's, let's clean our hearts Ask him to clean our hearts. Let us, let's care about what God cares about. Let's be a place, a church, where you don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be even good enough to come to Jesus. My prayer for you this morning is, same as my prayer for myself, that, that, we, that we seek him first, that we seek his forgiveness, that we, we repent of, of our pride, of our sin, of any time that we are tempted and and act in the same way they did. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, we love you. Lord, we praise you and we trust you. Grateful for what you have done for us in Jesus. Lord, we seek your forgiveness uh, for, for our sin. And Lord, we uh, are grateful for the opportunity to approach your table, uh, to remember uh, your sacrifice in the bread and the cup. In Jesus' name, amen. As we prepare for communion, this, uh, this song says, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Would you stand as we prepare for communion?
see.